Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Beal, and on behalf of MCNC and Akamai Technologies, I'd like to welcome you, welcome you to today's webinar. Uh, we're here to talk about MCNC's newest security service called Secure Application Access. Uh, we certainly appreciate you making time to join us today. I uh, would like to start off by, uh, on behalf of MCNC and Akamai, uh, both uh, wishing you and your families uh, well. I hope you're all staying safe and staying healthy in this uh, COVID-19 uh, time. So we know it's, it's crazy times for a lot of folks, so we certainly do appreciate you uh, carving out some time in your, in your day to join us on the webinar today. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, my name is Chris Beal. I am the Vice President of Security Initiatives and the Chief Information Security Officer at MCNC. Uh, my co-presenter for today is Patrick Sullivan. Patrick is the Chief Technology Officer for Security Strategy from Akamai Technologies. Uh, so thank you again for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, our, ag our agenda today uh, has uh, a few things that we want to cover. Uh, we want to start off by talking about some challenges that our community is facing uh, in trying to figure out how to provide uh, access to applications. Uh, we've had some new challenges thrust upon us in the last uh, couple of months with the COVID situation. Uh, so we want to talk some about specifically about those challenges. Uh, we want to cover what secure application access is as a service. And we'll talk about how this service can help address some of these challenges. And then we'll have a demo, a live demo that Patrick is going to run for us. Uh, and then we'll have time at the end for questions and answers. Uh, before we dive into the, the details, just a few uh, logistical things to talk about. Uh, the webinar today is being recorded. And that recording will be available on our website uh, once the presentation is complete today. Um, also, all of our uh, attendees are in listen-only mode, um, so you will not be able to speak, um, but we do have a mechanism uh, for you to relay your questions to us. So in the bottom of your Zoom window, you should see several buttons uh, that you can click on, one of which is labeled as Q&A. So if you click on that Q&A button, that should open a window that will allow you to type a question uh, that you may have as we go along or as we get towards the end. And during our Q&A uh, portion at the end of the presentation, that's where we will uh, go through all the questions that have been submitted and do our very best to get you an answer. And if we can't get an answer immediately, then we will uh, get your contact information from you and work to get you that answer after the presentation is over. Um, so that's our agenda for today. And that's how you can uh, get in touch with us. Um, if you do have any technical challenges, uh, you can't hear us or you can't see the slides or anything like that, please let us know that as well, either via the Q&A or the chat function. Uh, and uh, we'll see if we can take care of those issues along the way. So that's what we want to talk about today. So I'm going to start off uh, by talking about some traditional approaches to providing access to applications. Uh, most folks uh, traditionally have an environment that looks something like this, where on the left side of the red line, you have uh, your quote unquote internal network. Uh, you've got some servers or some applications that uh, exist on your internal network and hosts on that network are allowed to access that, those applications while they are connected to that network but may not be able to access them when they're on the right side of that red line, meaning they're at home or, or away. Um, so when we have these kind of applications, there are a number of approaches that uh, folks have traditionally taken to facilitate access to those applications. Uh, one of the very earliest methods was to actually take that application server and place it in a DMZ and then poke a hole in the firewall so that anyone on the internet would be allowed to connect to that uh, server. Um, we also have a VPN or a virtual private network, a piece of hardware that sits uh, along that network perimeter and allows remote users to connect to create a virtual connection as if they were uh, sitting on that internal network and then access to those applications would be facilitated that way. Um, we also have a class of uh, servers or applications that we would call uh, ADC or application delivery controller technology. There's a number of things that fit into this space. 
something like a Citrix environment or an F5 uh, that could be used to provide access to applications and broker that access. Uh, also a, a piece of hardware running custom software that sits on that network perimeter that facilitates allowing those external things to connect back into those systems on your internal network. So there are other ways to facilitate this kind of access, but traditionally uh, most of this access has been facilitated in this way. Uh, and hopefully that resonates with what uh, you have encountered um, in, in your challenges as IT pros trying to figure out how to deliver uh, access to your applications to your users. So let's talk specifically about some of the challenges uh, that exist in trying to facilitate access using these methods. Uh, the first is uh, how can we quickly grant access to internal applications that were never designed to be accessed remotely? And this is something that folks in MCNC's community uh, have experienced a lot uh, over the last couple of months in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, particularly in the, our education community. Uh, we have a number of applications that uh, folks uh, can access when they're on the internal network and most folks, their computer resides there and that's the only way they've ever needed to do it. Uh, and now all of a sudden everyone has been sent home, the buildings have been closed. And so folks are no longer present on that quote unquote internal network. And so uh, we've seen a lot of folks trying to figure out, okay, how am I going to get folks access to this ERP application or this uh, student information system application or transportation management application that I've never had to expose remotely before. So that's a common challenge that folks are looking to try to deal with. Uh, another challenge that, that we're seeing a lot of is that uh, traditional virtual private networks or VPNs are too permissive, meaning that they allow too much access uh, to the internal network. Um, and especially in this COVID world where we may be trying to use a VPN to allow uh, someone's home computer or a device that isn't managed by central IT to get on that internal network. Um, if they now have access to everything on the internal network, if the network isn't segmented properly internally, uh, that can create a, a pretty significant security challenge when you're now allowing these home computers that we don't manage uh, access to your internal network as it were. Um, VPN capacity growth is another challenge that we're seeing folks try to figure out uh, how to deal with. Um, you know, it's one thing to say, well, I can just add more licenses to my VPN uh, concentrator, but uh, what we've encountered in conversations with a lot of folks is maybe that concentrator can't accommodate uh, adding on hundreds more users all at once. Um, so now it's not just a question of buying more VPN licenses. Now it's a question of I have to add another VPN concentrator or upgrade to a, a bigger model uh, to a provide access to VPN for all of these new users that are suddenly needing uh, remote access. Uh, and so that can be uh, an expensive proposition. And it also might be a proposition that um, we need to accommodate now, but maybe in a year or two years, um, that big demand has gone away. And so now I'm stuck with this VPN concentrator with this big capacity that I had to buy, but I don't need it anymore in two years. Um, my capacity shrinks back down. So that's a challenge that folks are trying to figure out how to deal with as well. Uh, we referenced earlier those application delivery controller technologies. Um, those solutions are expensive and complicated. Uh, when you're talking about trying to manage and maintain a Citrix environment or an F5 environment, those are great technologies, um, but they, they require a specific skill set and a specific expertise um, that a lot of folks in our community don't have ready access to. Um, so not just the hardware and the software licenses are costly, but the people to run those and maintain them and configure them properly. Um, th that's also an expense that a lot of folks are trying to figure out um, what to do about. Um, the next challenge that we see is that what I'll call quote unquote simple solutions, um, they're pretty risky. And so a couple of things that would fall into this bucket are uh, Microsoft remote desktop. So we've had conversations with folks where uh, the one way that they think of that immediately I, I can provide access back to my internal network is I can stick uh, a, a Windows box in the DMZ and expose the remote desktop port to the world and let people connect to that. And now they can get back in to my internal network. Um, that's a pretty risky proposition. We have actually seen uh, at least one scenario that we're aware of where someone, a school district in our state has done that uh, and that remote desktop 
system was compromised and that led to a very significant ransomware infection uh, inside their internal network. Um, so that's a pretty risky solution to be implementing. Uh, another one that we see in this simple solution as well, I'll just poke a hole in the firewall. I'll allow uh, inbound port 80 or port 443 from the internet to connect to this uh, system on my internal network so that folks can access it remotely. Um, again, that also can be a very, very risky proposition um, if your network isn't properly segmented, if your applications haven't been constructed in a manner uh, to allow them to be uh, resilient against uh, all the folks that are scanning the internet looking for ways in. Um, so that can be a pretty risky proposition. Uh, user confusion is another challenge that we see folks trying to deal with, uh, meaning that um, when I'm sitting on the internal network, I might uh, use this URL or uh, this uh, piece of software to connect to this application. But when I leave the internal network, I have an entirely different way of trying to access that application. Uh, first, I have to connect to VPN, or maybe I have a different URL than I'm supposed to connect to. Um, so user confusion is something that uh, we see a lot of where uh, the access methods are, are changing based on uh, where you are and asking users to behave differently and understand that when I'm here, I do this, but when I'm over here, I have to do something completely different just to access the same application. Um, that, that's a challenge that exists uh, with trying to figure out how to provide secure access to applications. So all of this adds up uh, to say that we need a solution to help us centralize access and provide a consistent, uh, flexible, and most importantly, secure way to grant access to our applications, regardless if those applications exist on our quote unquote internal network or if they're uh, existing out in the cloud. Uh, so this is what we're looking for uh, in a solution to try to help solve all of these challenges. So I'll go back to our picture here and talk about uh, at a really high level what the Secure Application Access Service is from MCNC uh, and, and some of the pieces that are involved in it. So if you remember earlier, we had our internal application on the left side that, and our user out on the right, right side uh, with a laptop with an internet connection somewhere and they're trying to get access to this application. Uh, so the secure application access solution introduces this concept of a secure access cloud uh, and that's gonna be what your user uh, is going to initiate their connection to. Um, there's a component called a connector, which is a virtual machine that you would deploy somewhere on your uh, inside your network perimeter, it might be in a DMZ, it might be directly on your internal network. Um, how you would choose to deploy that is based on your particular network architecture, uh, but it, there's a, a VM that you're going to deploy in your environment somewhere. So that virtual machine is going to make an outbound TLS connection to this access cloud. So there's no inbound connectivity required here. You're not having to uh, poke holes in your firewall to allow external systems to connect to your internal network. It's all outbound connectivity. Uh, so this secure tunnel is created from the connector VM out to the cloud. And all the connectivity from the cloud uh, happens back to your network through this TLS tunnel. And then the connector VM is able to communicate with the application that you want to provide access to. So it's all happening uh, securely inside your environment. And then when it's outside your environment, it's happening over the TLS tunnel. So the laptop out on the internet is going to communicate directly over the internet to the access cloud, and then the connectivity back to the application that the user needs on your internal network is all happening over this uh, pre-established outbound tunnel. So there's some distinct advantages uh, to doing this type of scenario, and Patrick is gonna get into more detail about this, but I just wanted to talk at a high level. Um, this is a pretty simple deployment. Um, there's a single, connector that you need to deploy and you can deploy multiple ones and actually uh, as I'm reading this it's actually recommended to have uh, at least uh, two for redundancy sake but uh, it's a pretty simple deployment uh, so you have the connector VM and a cloud-based console. Um, the user experience is certainly simplified here because uh, there's no more well when I'm here I go here when I'm somewhere else I do something different. Uh, there's one consistent user experience they're always going to the secure access cloud uh, authenticating there, and then they're presented with the applications that they're allowed to access. 
So it creates that consistent, simplified experience. Uh, you can integrate this with existing single sign-on uh, solutions that you might already have in your environment. Um, and you can also do this without needing any specialized software, uh, client software that you would need to install. There is a software client that can enable some extended functionality, um, but for most applications, web-based applications, it's not required. Um, certainly this offers the opportunity for improved security. Um, and the most important element of this for me is that you are moving to a posture where you're accessing applications, not the internal network. So if you think about a VPN scenario, um, that external system is actually getting a virtual presence on your internal network. That's not the case with this solution. You're simply getting access to the applications that you want users to access. Uh, we talked about this already, but you do not need to provide inbound network connectivity to your uh, network in order for this solution to work. Um, so that's a really nice security benefit. Uh, you don't need to expose your network to the world. Uh, and then you also have the ability through the solution to control access to applications based on uh, users. So uh, you're not making access decisions about anyone that happens to get an IP address on my network can connect to this server. Uh, you're using this solution as a filter or a gateway and you can apply some fine-grained access controls to say, you know what, this particular accounting server uh, or application is only available to my accounting users and you can control that within the Secure Access Cloud. Um, from an economic standpoint, uh, it can also be uh, advantageous. Um, it's predictable OPEX instead of CAPEX, so you're not needing to buy an expensive piece of hardware to deploy on your network and then depreciate that over a number of years. Uh, and what we often see in those scenarios is if you're planning for a, a, a VPN refresh, as an example, um, you can't look at just what is my capacity that I need today. I have to look out over that five-year lifespan and think about what do I expect my capacity to need to be in five years? And you have to pay for all of that upfront, even if you don't need it today. Uh, so this solution is one that allows you to only pay for what you need. It's licensed based uh, on a per user basis. So you can scale it up and scale it down uh, easily as you go along. So those are some advantages of this type of uh, solution. So at this point, I'm going to hand it off to Patrick and let him get into some more details about uh, the solution and um, then take us through the demo. So Patrick, over to you. All right, thank you. Uh, let me first just do a check here. Is everybody able to, uh, or I guess Chris, you could be my, uh, my checker. Are you able to see uh, a slide here on what we're sharing from, uh, from Google? Yeah, I can stop sharing on my end if you want to share it from your end. Yeah, I, th I think I am sharing. Okay. Uh, so yeah, just a, another uh, couple words about the way this works. Uh, I think that was a, a really good overview. Uh, you know, essentially the, the way to think about this is uh, we're dividing kind of the access into uh, really kind of two components, right? One is sort of that outbound connection, which is initiated from the connector uh, that's co-resident with compute. Right, and, and the really nice part about that VM is you don't have to install one per, uh, per application, but you could basically on a segment that has applications. So if you have an application space in your co-location, uh, you, know, you would deploy, deploy uh, a pair of connectors there. If you have uh, infrastructure as a service, you have some compute there, uh, the, you know, the VM uh, would have a, the right modality for Amazon, Google, whatever uh, cloud provider you, you may select. And then you know that uh, that connector does initiate that dial-out connection, uh, functioning as a diode, so no inbound connections uh, are required, allowing you to establish a micro perimeter around a small group of applications. And really, from that point forward, no end-user traffic need connect directly to those applications. It would all flow through the identity-aware proxy architecture, uh, which is kind of that gatekeeper in the middle that, that's doing the the matchmaking at layer seven. Uh, and very much in keeping with zero trust philosophy. Really the philosophy here is all connections uh, are authenticated first before there's a connection made, uh, which is a departure from many perimeter uh, security models where you know, if you're uh, quote unquote on the network, uh, you're able to connect and then uh, authentication occurs later in that flow. Maybe there's a, a 
uh, username and password. So here, you know, an end user would authenticate, uh, and we're showing a, a number of, uh, of options here. It's a very flexible architecture based on your policy, and policy could vary app by app, uh, but some of the factors you could consider would be, uh, you know, checking for the, the existence of a valid client certificate. You could obviously check for valid credentials uh, if you wish, uh, or you can make that optional. And then you could plug into uh, multi-factor authentication. Uh, as well, we do things like check for the, the posture of the device to make sure that there's a minimum uh, posture of that device to connect. Uh, and again, that policy is contextual and can vary based on the sensitivity of the application. Uh, so for each of these components, it's a open architecture, very flexible. You could use a native capability to the service for MFA, for identity, for device posture, uh, but it's also open if you have uh, you know, an MFA provider that you already have an affinity for, we plug into that. Uh, if you wanna derive uh, device posture from your EDR solution, we can uh, pull that. Uh, so very, very flexible policy engine. But really the model there is the end user connects to that identity aware proxy. We communicate with your identity store. Uh, again, whether that's something you store uh, with us or, or you point us to an IDAS or a directory service uh, inside the data center, uh, however you wanna maintain identity. And then really what we'll do there is understand after we do strong authentication of the user and have confidence that they are who they say what they are, we will consult with that identity store to, to derive uh, least privilege access for that user. Uh, so if the user happens to be in the HR department, their identity would tell us they have access to the productivity suite, uh, as well as a suite of HR applications. You know, maybe if they're a manager, there's an additional set of, of applications they gain access to. Uh, but that uh, identity aware proxy would be that gatekeeper at layer seven. Uh, and any request outside of the, that least privileged set of applications would be met with a, uh, a user-friendly error, basically saying, you know, you don't have access to this application. Uh, please contact HR admin to gain access to this HR application if you think uh, that that needs to be updated. So the nice part here is it's a single uh, location to store that access. Uh, so if a uh, identity, a, a instance in your identity store leaves the organization, uh, you know that would flow through immediately and, and their access would be deprecated because they, they no longer exist in an identity store. It's a really nice one-stop shop to, to remove any of that residual access, uh, which is also often a challenge. So we talked about this, you know, the, the access proxy is really that uh, application layer gatekeeper. Uh, connectors can be deployed to infrastructure as a service, your own data center, uh, wherever needed. Uh, and really there's, there's kind of two modes of operation, right? So what we often see is uh, third parties uh, and maybe there are classes of, of jobs uh, that uh, can be supported with a client list. So if you have people that, uh, that just need uh, basically access to web or SSH RDP that will be monitored uh, via the, the access proxy. You can support that in a clientless mode. Uh, often for, uh, for kind of super users, uh, employees, we, we will push a client that gives you access to uh, you know, arbitrary ports and protocols. So if you have legacy applications, that's a nice way to gain access. And then we can also derive a, a, a much more precise uh, understanding of the the posture of the device if we've instrumented the, the endpoint much more robust uh, device posture. Uh, something else to, to point out here is part of this solution, we also can perform uh, industry leading application security uh, checks here. And I think that's really important when you look at the, the recent attacks that we've seen targeting the remote access industry. Uh, really, I think since Black Hat uh, 2019, uh, I think what's, what's happened is remote access VPNs uh, and virtualization services have been around for a long time. Uh, so they're supporting legacy protocols. And then over the years, they've started to support kind of extending an HTML5 uh, access to web apps, uh, which tends to have a very unique attack surface. So there have been very well documented series of attacks from nation states, uh, ransomware games, uh, financially motivated attackers. There've been, uh, you know, continued warnings from the NSA and 5 I peers, the FBI, uh, you name it, just kind of targeting uh, or warning of the, the threat of, of people targeting 
uh, remote access VPN and virtualization services. So what's nice here is, you know, even as part of this flow, you can still have policy here that's, that's in line uh, for the, the applications that, that happen to be web apps. You can filter out uh, any of those modern web application attacks. Uh, and if you look through the Black Hat talk on, on some of the techniques that were used to, to target the little web server that's running in many uh, uh, remote access VPNs, those are pretty trivial web application attacks to defend. Uh, so, so I think there's a, an attack surface reduction there as well. But the model here, regardless client or uh, clientless, you're giving access on a uh, precision basis on an app by app basis. So if I'm on the client and I run a port scan, the IP address that I see is the, uh, the IP address of the access proxy. Uh, as we all know, if you're on a VPN or on a corporate network and you run a port scan, you often will receive a terrifying uh, inventory of private IPs uh, because of kind of that, that model of connect before you authenticate. Uh, you've got quite a bit of reachability in, in those, those instances. So this is really that zero trust uh, access model where, you, where authentication occurs before any type of a connection. Uh, so the, the, the access here, again, it's, uh, it's all mediated by that layer seven proxy uh, that sits upon a, a policy engine allowing for uh, really conditional access based on a number of factors that we'll talk about. Uh, so some of that context could be, uh, you know, really anything that's a, a valid, uh, layer seven attribute, right? We can look at time of day policy, location, uh, anything around uh, the request uh, syntax itself. Uh, obviously identity, we would pull, uh, if somebody has uh, a valid need to access that application, that's, that's a primary uh, signal that we would consider. Uh, we'll go into some more detail on the, the device, but quite a bit of data about the device uh, itself as well. And then we pull in uh, signals about uh, how we're seeing the device behave. Uh, so either uh, third-party signals from uh, EDRs like Carbon Black, or we can consider uh, what Akamai is observing, uh, if you're familiar with our uh, threat protector service where we inspect recursive DNS. If we see a particular client, either as that device has uh, moved to the home office or in the corporate network, a client beaconing out to command and control or sites that we know to be serving malware, uh, we can deprecate the, the reputation of that device. And then maybe they would have access only to uh, non-sensitive applications. Uh, and they would be served obviously a, a different remediation message there that would simply say in most cases, please contact the help desk uh, before you're, you're able to access a sensitive financial application or a software repository. Uh, you don't want to necessarily tee off somebody who has presence on that device, but there it would be basically that the help desk team would remediate that device and then allow restore uh, posture. And then, you know, again, we would go back to monitoring their, uh, their behavior, tying in the behavior of that device to the access decision uh, context. So the Akamai native uh, device posture, again, if we're not pulling this from somewhere else, uh, quite a few things that we can look at here. Uh, all the things you would expect, you know, do you want to make a decision based on whether or not somebody has uh, a jailbroken device, uh, if they have somehow managed to uh, disengage, dis dis encryption outside of policy, uh, and then, you know, things like uh, AV and, uh, you know, keeping up to date with uh, OS and, and software patches. So if there's a, uh, you know, a CVE 10 out of 10 on Firefox, for example, you may say uh, until somebody patches that, downloads the latest version, we're not gonna allow them access to high sensitivity applications. So all of that is, is permitted in a very flexible way. And again, you're pushing the remediation back to the end user uh, with very clear messaging on, on what they should do uh, rather than asking them to call the help desk uh, for every case. Uh, so this is an example you know, of uh, you know, a very clear message uh, you know, in this case, uh, we, we went through sort of a, a contrived example where we disengage, disengage the OS firewall. Uh, so in that case, somebody has deliberately done that outside of policy, and they would not be able to access uh, a particular application uh, based on, uh, again, on policy. So it would be pushed back to the end user what they need to do uh, in order to regain access, uh, re-engage your, your OS firewall, uh, and then you would then have... Um, your access restored to whatever application you have. 
This would also trigger, uh, you know, alerting in the dashboard. So if, <clears throat> if the user was unable to do this themselves, uh, somebody on the help desk team would be able to look up the error and understand why this was happening. Uh, again, optional uh, contextual policy that is customized for each organization. All right, thank you, Patrick. And with that, I'm going to jump into a demo uh, from our MCNC test account. Uh, you should be able to see on my screen here, uh, this kind of dashboard that you get when you log in. Uh, unfortunately, this is a, a little demo environment, so there's not a lot of interesting activity happening here, but uh, you, you can see uh, in this dashboard, you'll be able to see the locations across the globe that users are logging in from, and you can drill down uh, into this map and see, you can get information on which browsers and which operating systems users are using and uh, some information about user activity. Uh, so I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time about that, but uh, you can see a little flavor of what you'd be able to get here. Um, the first thing you have to do when setting up uh, the environment is deploy a connector. Uh, so the connector, remember, is the virtual machine that you deploy inside your environment. So you can see here, we've got a couple, um, if you want to add one, you just give it a name. And you can choose the type of connector, whether it's going in Amazon, whether it's a Docker container, uh, Hyper-V, uh, VirtualBox, VMware, what type of image you want. Uh, so you would select that uh, and then save those changes. Uh, and then what would happen here is you would be prompted to download a package and then you could take that package and deploy it into your virtual machine environment and there are instructions on, on how to do that. Uh, you deploy it in your VM environment, you walk through the network configuration and setup, uh, and uh, then it would connect out to the cloud. And once it's done that, uh, you'll be able to see here, uh, connector is running that it would connect up um, and sync up with the, the cloud environment here. So that's the first piece. Uh, once you have your connector uh, talking to the cloud service and that uh, TLS tunnel is established, then uh, you move on to user identities. Uh, and the first thing we want to do here is look at directories. Um, so uh, a directory is a, a set of users that will authenticate to this service. So by default, built into every environment, there is a cloud directory. So these are user accounts that only exist uh, inside of Akamai's cloud environment. Uh, and you can create groups and create user accounts here. Um, and that would be specific to this Akamai service login. Alternatively, you can also uh, configure the Akamai environment to talk to an existing directory. So here you can see uh, we have configured this to uh, point to MCNC's, uh, an instance of Active Directory inside our environment that we use for testing. Um, so that uh, is an option here. So you can say add a directory and just, in here and then you can select the type and you can see you can choose Active Directory, LDAP uh, or ADLDS. Uh, so you can configure that. Uh, we'll choose Active Directory and I'll just show you a little bit what this screen uh, looks like. So here's where you would specify the uh, domain name or the IP address um, that for the directory server that you want to communicate with. By default it's using LDAPS uh, and you would give it the domain name uh, and then you specify credentials um, that this service would use to connect to and authenticate to your directory service. Uh, and then there's attribute mappings. If you need to come in and change those, uh, you can do that. Um, so pretty straightforward here, how you can uh, set up and configure uh, a new directory in this environment. Uh, once the directory is configured, uh, you can point to uh, or configure an identity provider. You can see that we have some here. Uh, if you wanted to add a new one, give it a name and you can select the type. Uh, you can point actually to Google. So um, if you wanna integrate with your existing Google Apps for Education environment and have that be your authentication source, you could do that. Uh, if you have AD in the cloud with Azure, there are some other IDP types listed here, one login, ping, Okta, uh, or you can use third-party SAML. Um, so lots of different options for configuring your identity provider. Uh, and once you have done that, uh, then your next, thing that you're looking to do is start to configure some applications. So I'm gonna ask you to take note here, we have an IDP uh, that's configured for 
um, our, this test environment, um, there's a particular URL here that I'm going to copy and we're going to use it um, and show you what that looks like. So if I go over to applications, you can see we will have some applications that we've already deployed uh, in our environment and it's pretty straightforward to add one. Uh, you can choose, is this a, a web application? And there are some pre-configured types here, SharePoint, Jira. Uh, if it's a, a remote desktop application you want to enable, you can choose that. Uh, some other types here, Confluence, Jenkins, uh, SSH, VNC, uh, those kind of things. And then there are some pre-built connectors for uh, software as a service or cloud-based applications. So uh, Google Apps or G Suite, uh, Office 365, ServiceNow, Salesforce, Dropbox, those are already uh, here for use uh, out of the box. So those are our types that you can see available. Uh, I'm gonna show you what uh, it looks like from a user perspective here. So if you remember earlier that um, URL that we copied that pointed to one of our identity providers. So I would enter that uh, here and it's gonna ask me to log in. So this particular identity provider is configured to utilize the built-in Akamai directory. Uh, so these are local users that only exist in uh, this cloud environment. So I will authenticate with uh, that credential. And then I have enabled Duo for multi-factor authentication here. So you can see, uh, as we talked about earlier, you have multi-factor options. So I am going to complete this multi-factor process here. And now I've got this view, uh, it's like a portal view um, for some of the applications that we've configured to be connected to this uh, IDP. Um, so these are just some test applications. Um, this one is just a, a generic web application. I can click on that uh, and now I'm able to access that application. Uh, this web application is not uh, available outside of MCNC's internal network, um, but I'm able to access it here from my home by going through the remote access service. Uh, so that's an option. Um, also, you can see there's an SSH that we've enabled here. So in my web browser, I now have an SSH connection that I can use to uh, access services via SSH on my protected internal network. Um, and I can do that securely with that multi-factor authentication protection without me having to modify uh, any of the uh, network parameters there. So that's uh, an easy thing you can do. Uh, also remote desktop. Uh, so again, strictly in a browser, no third-party client software required. Uh, you can see here that I'm able to uh, connect just with a web browser over the web securely and access uh, systems via RDP that exist on my internal network. So this is a really great use case uh, to facilitate that kind of remote access in a secure manner as well. So those are just a really high level overview, a uh, quick demo. Um, we have some other videos available uh, that we can share with you that go into much more detail about uh, how this uh, environment works and how to configure specific elements of it. Um, but uh, that I think is, is will cover us for this uh, quick demo. So with that, uh, I think Patrick has a couple of more slides and then we will head off to the Q&A portion. So I guess, you know, the last slide, you know, here that we wanted to talk about is, is kind of just, you know, bigger picture, you know, where we see this moving. This is very much, uh, an architecture that's consistent with uh, the NIST guidance around zero trust architecture, where they really talk about uh, kind of each incremental technology decision you make, try to move away from granting kind of the vast access that you get with a perimeter uh, security model and, and uh, move towards more of that zero trust architecture. This, this is a huge step towards that uh, when it comes to user access to application, sort of that north south. Uh, and as well, it's very consistent if you're familiar with Gartner's uh, SASE model, Secure Access Service Edge, where they're really talking about the, uh, the convergence of a variety of services into kind of a, a SaaS model uh, where you pay for what you use and, and you're able to, uh, to get signal across uh, what once was disparate services as those become integrated. Uh, you're able to, to, to share signal across those. So for example, sharing signal from recursive DNS uh, and what's happening there into a, an access decision for corporate applications. Uh, also uh, 
what, what Gartner, uh, the, the uh, acronym they use for web application protection and API protection, uh, all of that would be embedded in the, the same type of service. So very much consistent with kind of the, the, the guidance that we're hearing from, from leaders at NIST who are looking, you know, 10 years out uh, at architecture, Gardner, and then obviously Forrester who coined kind of the zero trust uh, buzzword uh, themselves. Uh, so, so that, you know, huge step forward along that path, uh, really whichever of these you're following, whether it's kind of the NIST uh, or the Gardner uh, or, or Forrester uh, flavor of that, uh, of that offer. So Chris, that's what I had. I don't know if we have any uh, questions in the queue. Okay, uh, looks like we've got uh, a few questions coming into the Q&A here. So uh, I will start answering those. Uh, the first one says, is this a move away from Zscaler app as a solution for remote access to internal resources, specifically ZPA? So this question, um, is coming, MCNC has a, a relationship with Zscaler uh, where we provide their uh, ZIA um, uh, solution for web content filtering uh, and web security for kind of outbound proxy and, and web content security. Um, we do not have any relationship with Zscaler to provide their ZPA service. Uh, we evaluated that service and when we looked at the marketplace and we ended up selecting to partner with Akamai for that service. So um, Akamai's solution here would be a direct competitor to Zscaler's ZPA solution. And we opted to go with the Akamai uh, service as what we would be delivering as part of MCNC's service. So uh, that's not in any way to disparage Zscaler's solution. Um, it does a lot of things really well, um, but it is important I think in answering this question to note that their ZPA product is very, it's a completely different and distinct product from their uh, ZIA uh, product, which is the web proxy uh, piece. And so um, hopefully I have answered that question. It's not a move away from that for MCNC because MCNC has no uh, relationship to that product. Um, the, the product that we have a relationship with is ZIA. Uh, and so MCNC would offer that if you want a service to uh, facilitate that coming through MCNC, this would, the Akamai solution is the one that we would offer to do that. So hopefully that answers the question. Uh, if not, you can uh, hit us back in the Q&A box and I'll uh, do my best to, to make that distinction. Um, next question says, does this come with its own SSO solution? If so, does it support MFA and password recovery and reset? So uh, Patrick, maybe you wanna answer that? So it does. So you can use, uh, you know, Akamai for that element, or if you have your own SSO, then we would plug into that. Uh, if you have your own identity uh, in place, I think we've seen plenty of examples of both uh, scenario. Uh, so flexible architecture and not only SSO, but MFA, you can, uh, you, you can make in incremental decisions there, however you'd like to have that. You could uh, use kind of the, the native solution with Akamai on that, or if you have a, an MFA or SSO solution through an IDP that you like, uh, you can leverage that as well. So it's, it's very flexible there. Uh, and, and I will say from MCNC's perspective, that's one of the things that we liked in our evaluation was that flexibility um, because we, you have the ability to integrate with multiple different directories. So you can integrate with uh, your, your on-prem or your cloud-based uh, AD. Um, you can also integrate with Google directory uh, or another third-party directory. Uh, and then you can also, in addition to that, use Akamai's built-in directory. So one scenario that we uh, have seen folks utilize is um, if there's uh, maybe some contractors that you need to give access to something on your internal network, but you don't want to create accounts for those folks in your internal active directory, you know, most of your employees could have uh, an access experience that's integrated with your uh, active directory environment and picking up SSO there, but you could have a separate experience for uh, the contractors and their accounts could exist directly in the built-in Akamai directory and therefore you don't have to create accounts for them in your internal directory. Uh, so again, lots of flexibility there and, and you can mix and match and have different environments that integrate with different uh, directories all in the same uh, uh, 
environment here inside of uh, EAA. So it's, it's a pretty flexible solution there. Um, so the next question is, how does it work with software as a service products? Will it increase latency or degrade performance? Yes, so the, what we would be doing there is, is we would be in the control path, but not the data path. So that's how we, we could extend that SSO to your SaaS apps. Uh, so it would be kind of a standard, uh, you know, uh, IDP SSO. So you'd get a redirect from your SaaS provider back to the IDP that would then uh, validate that the user has been logged in and you would move from there. Uh, so we would not be in path from the end user to the SaaS app post authentication, uh, which is a different flow than it would be for, uh, for apps that are in IAS or your infrastructure where we would be both in the data and the control path. Uh, and there uh, we're applying uh, technologies to speed the performance. So the, the standard uh, expectation should be for, for corporate apps that you own, uh, we, will, we will deliver a performance benefit. Uh, that's one of the, the core benefits of the platform. Okay. Uh, next question is, does it launch the applications within the interface? The most common experience is people will just access their, their applications natively. So as you access uh, Office, you would pull up your Office client and it would connect uh, to, to the Office back in. Uh, as you connect to a web application, you would just pull up your, your browser and connect to those. Uh, so there's minimal interference to the end user experience. It's kind of a native, transparent experience to the user. Yeah, and I, I would throw on top of that, uh, this is another area where there's a lot of flexibility. Um, if you want to give your users uh, a single URL that they access and have that portal type experience, you can do that. Uh, and so you would see that uh, chiclet view that you saw earlier when you clicked on an application there. Um, generally, that experience is to open uh, a new tab or a new browser window, and then you're accessing that application there. So that's a, a pretty familiar user experience. Um, but you can also, as Patrick was alluding to, um, if you want, create separate individual URLs so you don't have to go through the portal. And so that URL would be consistent for the user regardless of where they sit. So if they're on your internal network, they're using the same URL that they would uh, use when they're uh, outside of your internal network. Um, so that's a scenario that this solution enables you to configure as well. Uh, just requires you to uh, set up the, the DNS and the uh, SSL certificates in a manner to support uh, all of that connectivity, but it's, uh, it's not difficult to do. Uh, the next question is, any bandwidth requirements for end users to access applications, speaking of remote workers? Um, so I'm not sure I completely understand that, but Patrick, maybe you do. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think it makes sense. So for, for the standard remote worker, uh, for an application, uh, you know, we're not adding overhead there. It's a proxy solution. So they would make a request uh, to that access proxy, the identity aware proxy, the same as they would to the application. So there's, uh, in that case, it would be, uh, from the end user perspective, identical. Uh, you will derive some benefit uh, in traffic flows, potentially for apps that are hosted in the cloud. You know, since the inspection here is done at the edge, uh, the, that identity aware proxy will route traffic to the appropriate uh, compute. Uh, so there's no need to, you know, if somebody's accessing an application in IAS, that traffic need not flow to a corporate uh, data center for inspection. It can flow directly from the identity aware proxy to compute. So you may see some offload uh, at the, uh, you know, at the data center level. Okay, hopefully that uh, makes sense. If not, um, please pop a follow-up in the Q&A window. Uh, looks like uh, maybe there was th this person was saying they had some users that had a slow uh, DSL connection at home and they experienced some loading problems trying to access internal applications. Yes. So, in, you know, in that case, if, if it's a first mile issue and, and somebody's uh, residential network is, is uh, you know, has deteriorated, uh, you know, no magic bull around that. Uh, however, you know, we are moving that point of inspection closer to the end user and doing things like TCP optimization. So there may be uh, some relief around that and, and we can do route optimization, you know, if there is a, 
uh, upstream peering problem. We do look for better routes across the internet uh, down to the end user. So those are things we can do, but, but ultimately if somebody's on a residential network and their, their DSL uh, first mile connection uh, has poor quality, no magic bullet for, for that particular problem. Okay. Uh, there is a question here uh, about how much does this cost? Um, so uh, I, my answer there is that um, in an effort to try to keep the cost as low as possible for MCNC's community, um, we don't have uh, standard pricing tiers that we use that you may be familiar with. Um, so every uh, quote that we generate is a custom quote. Um, we, we found that with the tiering um, scenario, you know, in constructing those tiers, uh, the pricing changes artificially. If you're on the, the low end of the tier, you end up um, paying uh, too little uh, to cover our costs. And if you're at the, the high end of the tier, you end up paying way more than you ultimately should to cover our costs. And so um, the way we approach pricing is uh, to have you tell us how many users uh, you're looking to cover with the solution. And we will quote you the exact amount um, that needs to, uh, to, to cover that. And we're happy to have a conversation with you. I will tell you um, that the starting price from MCNC is $5,500 per year. Uh, and that includes the first 50 uh, users. And then there is a per user uh, license cost that's added on uh, after that. Um, and we, again, back to the um, prior point, you can scale up and scale down uh, as based on users as you need to. Um, one question that we commonly get about price and, and users, um, is this a concurrent user model or a named user model? Um, this is, there's no concurrency uh, built into this. If you have users that are going to utilize this service, then uh, you need to pay for a license for the, uh, each of the users that will be utilizing the service. Um, but we're happy to uh, talk to you more and give you a, a, a custom quote um, based on what you need uh, for that. And, and my belief is that uh, through our partnership with Akamai, um, that if you're interested in a service like this, that um, we should be able to provide you uh, a better price, hopefully, uh, than you can get going anywhere else. Um, that's part of the magic of what, what we try to do in working with folks um, that, that choose to partner with us. And so um, we would hope that that would be the case um, so any, any solution that you're uh, considering in this space, I uh, would uh, ask you to uh, talk to us, have us uh, give you a quote, uh, because if nothing else, um, you might be able to use that quote to beat up uh, somebody else and get a better price for yourself. So uh, that's another service that we often provide uh, for folks as part of what we do here. Um, so I'm just looking through the rest of the questions. There's a question, will a copy of the recording be sent out uh, for review later? Uh, yes. Um, once the webinar is finished and uh, we've processed the recording, we will, I think, be posting it on the MCNC website. Um, and you may even get an email uh, if you registered uh, for the webinar, letting you know uh, that it's there. Uh, let's see, I think that is all the questions that I have uh, in the Q&A window. If there are others, um, please type them in that Q&A so that we can uh, get you an answer here. So through our partnership with Akamai, we are able to offer a 60-day no obligation evaluation. Um, and uh, also the link for uh, accessing the webinar, uh, you can see there on the screen. So that when the recording is uh, posted, it will be posted at that URL that you see on the screen on MCNC's website. Uh, and um, you can also register there uh, to access the uh, no obligation eval. Um, so in doing that, we will ask you for a couple of pieces of information, and then we will work with you to get it uh, set up and configured. Um, and another thing I would say about this eval is we know that there in the COVID scenario, there are folks in our community who are looking for creative ways to provide remote access. Um, so even if uh, you're not necessarily interested in purchasing long term, but you're looking for a way to bridge a gap, um, this can be a way to do that. So uh, we would ask you to contact us and uh, see if we can help you out. Uh, if you're in a jam, 
looking for a way to facilitate remote access because uh, what we don't want is folks in our community um, providing insecure access to applications that end up creating uh, a bigger security problem for, uh, for them down the road. So um, please reach out and talk to us if you're in that boat. We want to help you out. Um, so you can see on the screen uh, my name and email address uh, and also uh, another name and email address, Ruthie Mabe, uh, who is our manager of security services here at MCNC. Um, so that's how you can contact us if you uh, have any additional questions or want to have a, a more in-depth conversation or um, want to learn more about it. Um, please drop one of us an email and we will get back with you as soon as we can. Um, Patrick, any parting thoughts from you? No, I appreciate the, the opportunity to come and present and uh, in particular, all the questions. It was a lot of, a lot of good discussion there. So I appreciate that. Okay. Well, uh, again, on behalf of Akamai and MCNC, we uh, sincerely thank you for carving a little bit of time out uh, to attend the webinar today. Um, we look forward to having further conversations with you. If you have any questions, please let us know. Uh, and please do uh, stay safe and healthy. And thanks for joining us today.